Hi, this is Jamie with Stonemeyer Games. On today's Sunday sit down video, I thought I'd talk about expensive games, specifically uh, games that retail for over $80. And I've picked that qualifier because uh, we are working on a game, maybe even multiple games, that have an MSRP of over $80. And I, so I've been really kind of exploring the market to see what that, what that means. Uh, like what, what, what are the expectations that go along with a game that's, that cost over $80? What are people willing to, willing to pay for? Um, what, what will people balk at? Like what price will they balk at if they, if they see a price in comparison to certain things? Um, and so I just wanted to explore that today. I don't have a real structure I'm going to follow today, so I'll jump around a little bit. I do have a top five that I'll go into at some point of a top my top five games that retail for over eighty dollars, just because I like top five and top ten lists. Um, but uh, let's start with uh, one of the reasons this came to mind actually was with uh, Scythe, and this goes to the publisher side of things. Why are why is MSRP the way it is anyway? Um, MSRP is the, the price that we suggest that retailers sell products for. And really in this day and age, MSRP is based on two things. One, it's, it's typically at least a five times multiplier on the manufacturing cost. And the reason for that is because say I have a game that costs $20 to make, um, so a five times multiplier would be $100. So we come up with that $100 price. When a distributor buys that game from us, they get a 60% discount. So a distributor will pay $40 for that. And that's why that five, that five times multiplier comes into play because I spent $20 to make the game. For me to make enough money off of that game to even reprint it at all, to have enough money to reprint it, uh, that's where that 60% discount comes in uh, that or that, that $40 price or the $40 cost. Um, and even then, like it's not even quite enough because that doesn't include freight shipping and the other costs that, that are involved in, in making a game. But that's like the bare minimum pretty much. And then the distributor goes and sells it to the retailer usually at 50% off MSRP. So a retailer might pay uh, $50 for that $100 game, which seems like the retailer then has a big margin um, of profit. But A... Uh, like a brick and mortar retailer, they have a lot of other costs that they have to pay for. So yeah, they're paying, uh, they, if they sell that game for $100, they're getting a nice margin, but they have a lot of other upkeep costs. They have staff, they have, the, they have the building they have to pay for, they have all that stuff they have to pay for. And they're also competing against online retailers. And online retailers often uh, have much lower margins because they make up for it in volume. So an online retailer might sell that game for $70 and they make a $20 profit, but they have less overhead. Um, so that's where that, that MSRP typically comes from and from the, the, the publishing side of things, uh, $20 game usually ends up being at least a hundred dollar MSRP. Many publishers, I think will make it go higher than that and reasonably so. And this brings us back to Scythe. Scythe was, uh, I, this Scythe came out where I originally priced Scythe in 2015. And at the time I did not feel comfortable making it a game of, that had a price of over $80. $80 to me was like the most I could see someone paying for Scythe, uh, despite all the stuff that's in that box. And But $80 was less than a five times multiplier. Scythe costs, depending on how many, make, how many copies we make in a print run, it costs between $18 and $19 to make. So really the MSRP should have been $90 or $95 from the start. And so uh, a few months ago, I made a difficult decision to increase the MSRP of Scythe. The MSRP for Scythe is now $90, which is what it should have been for years based on that very important multiplier. Um, and it's kind of the reason that we actually haven't made any money off of Scythe because we've only reprinted it. And every time we reprint it, we lose a little bit of money because we don't have that, that proper multiplier in place. Um, so that, that was Scythe. Scythe is now over $90. We do have a product now that is over $90 in retail. If you see Scythe on a retail store, doesn't mean you always see it priced that much. Like if you go on Amazon or on Miniature Market or Cool Stuff, I'm sure you'll see a lower price because online retailers often do charge less. And local retailers do too, but probably not too much of a discount. 
And that was actually one of my things that I wanted to talk about here in this video, that the impact of online discounters, which I, I'm not going to disparage here at all. And I, you can in the comments if you do it constructively. Um, my intent is not to disparage them, but they are having an impact on the MSRP. The MSRP, I think, matters less to the consumer now because you don't even really see it or you don't even care about it. I, I've, in fact, I've heard podcasters talk about games and when they talk about the price of the game, they use the price that they can buy it for on Cool Stuff or Miniature Market or Amazon. They don't even care about the MSRP because that's not what they're paying. And I think that's kind of worth considering as a publisher now. Like when I think of this, when I think of publishing a game with an MSRP between $80 and $100, um, even though that's daunting to me, not even just as a publisher, but also as a consumer, I have to keep in mind that most people aren't going to pay that much for it. They're going to pay 80. They're going to pay, pay 75, pay, pay 70, maybe even less, depending on the online retailer. And so as I'm strategizing about this uh, for our future games, I, I think that's important for me to keep in mind. So I'm curious about, that's one of the things that I'd like your thoughts on today. Like, do you even care about the MSRP? Or are you really? Do you really just care about the, the price that you pay? Today we're still going to focus on the on the MSRP that that uh, the the price that the publisher puts on the game, and some some games that are in that price range. I'm just going to talk about some games now on that list. I found a list of about 15 such games, and I'm going to look for commonalities. I don't have any notes made in advance, but I'm kind of look kind of look for commonalities like between components and the weight of the game, the replayability, to see if there's some common elements here that differentiate an 80 plus dollar game or a game that costs over $80 from other games. And these are games that people have paid for. Like the, these are quite a few games that are, that are very popular. Let's start with the biggest one probably is Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven I think MSRP is at 120. Um, Gloomhaven is a giant box. It offers a lot of replayability. It has miniatures. Um, and it has a lot of components. It has a lot of cards in the box. And it offers replay replayability, not just in terms of scenarios and different tiles, but also in terms of different characters. And uh, yeah, but mostly just the characters. There's tons of re replayability from the different characters. Another one is A Feast for Odin. A Feast for Odin is uh, one of the really the few Euro games on this list. No miniatures at all in A Feast for Odin. It has some, uh, actually not even custom dice. It has some, some dice, but no custom dice. So A Feast of Odin is purely just a ton of cardboard in the box with two custom inserts. Um, I don't think Gloom Gloomhaven, at least the version that I had, doesn't have custom inserts. Feast for Odin does have two important custom inserts to organize the components, and then just a lot of cardboard. Again, a lot of replayability in terms of uh, the, the, the different, uh, like different roll cards that can come up in the game. I forget what they're called, like occupations, I think. And uh, overall, just like a, just a lot of stuff in the box. There's Carson City Big Box. This is one of several like big box games on here, which I think uh, can eclipse that $80 mark because they are a big box. They include a lot of expansions right inside the box. And so they're able to take a game that might have otherwise had a, maybe a $60 MSRP or even less. There's another one on this game list that's even less. And they're able to increase that by quite a bit. Now, I find that an interesting strategy as a publisher. While I do get people asking me from time to time, like, will you offer a version of X game that 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 everything is in the same box. Um, for me, that doesn't seem like a great strategy because you are you're cutting you're significantly increasing the barrier to entry for the game and a game that you could offer for less. Um, I think Carson City did it because I think they probably had a Kickstarter for this big box version. I'm almost positive they did. But from a retail strategy, if I go into a retailer and I see uh, a $90 game with three expansions included versus a $55 version of that game, and then I can add on the expansions later that I want. I think I'm much like I might. I'm much more likely to get my foot in the door of that game if I go for the $55 version. So I think that's an interesting strategy. Crescent City, what does it have in the box? It has. Uh, it does. It has uh, mainly. It's just a bunch of expansions. I think that's what's what mainly differentiates it. It also has some big wooden components in it. Some big wooden mountains. Uh, Lords of Hellas is one that retails for over uh, eighty dollars. It has beautiful miniatures, and uh, a big board. I would say the miniatures are probably the main thing that that increases this price so much, and that people are probably willing to pay for. It has these really cool miniatures that you kind of piece together as you build these monuments. 
Railways of the World. This is one that surprised me a little bit for being on this list because I wouldn't, uh, like, unlike some some of the art in particular, like oh, Gloomhaven has great art, A Feast for Odin, uh, Lords of Hellas has great art. Railways of the World, I wouldn't quite say has the most beautiful art. Um, it does have a lot of chits. It and it has the. It does have miniatures. It has uh, miniatures that mark. Uh, which cities are, are active or not. So I think that's probably the main thing that increases that cost. And it's a giant box. It's a giant board. That one surprised me a little bit that it that it was priced over 80 because I doubt it costs that much to make. But um, maybe those miniatures do, do add to the cost quite a bit. Rising Sun, that's one where the miniatures definitely um, increase the price quite a bit. Uh, Rising Sun is, is a definitely, a, in my opinion, a very beautiful game from the, the box art to the miniatures. So that that's... Um, and it's a, actually one thing, one category I haven't mentioned here for uh, for these games is uh, their ranking. Like how how well received are they, and how big of an impact that has on people's willingness to obviously continue to pay for it over time. Uh, Gloomhaven, number one game in the world. A Feast for Odin, I think it's up there in the top ten at this point, maybe top twenty. Uh, Railways of the World, I don't know the ranking. Rising Sun, I'm sure is pretty high, and I'll, I'll mention that as I get to these other ones. I'll add that the the ranking of the game. So people's perception of the game, how much they like it, I'm sure will we'll tie into this list. Uh, yeah, in fact, I'll, I'll jump to uh, yeah a couple of these coming up in the list. Cthulhu Wars, I, I don't know the ranking for the Cthulhu Wars, but that is one that retails for quite a bit, quite a bit over $100, I think. Again, a lot of miniatures in that game. Um, yeah, we're seeing miniatures definitely as a pattern here. Gaia Project, not a miniatures game. Just again, similar to Feast for Odin, just a lot of stuff in the box, a lot of different factions to play. And that one is very highly ranked. So a lot of replay, re, replayability. Uh, the weight of the game is fairly high. That's one thing I haven't really talked about here. Glo Gloomhaven has a fairly high weight. Feast for Odin, high weight. I'm not talking about uh, uh, pounds or, or ounces. I'm talking about um, the, the, the depth, the complexity of the game. And Guy Project definitely is very deep in that way. A Darkest Night. This was one that, uh, that I played a few months ago, maybe even longer than that. Sometime last year I played this. Darkest Night does have miniatures. It has a ton of replayability, and it is essentially a big box game at this point. They've included a lot of expansions in the core game of Darkest Night, which takes it over that $80 price, $80 price point. Twilight Imperium, kind of the granddaddy of, uh, of big, expensive games. I think this is a $150 game. It has a ton of miniatures. A lot of replayability with the different factions. It's uh, it, it's uh, a long game. I wonder if that should go on this list, game, the length of these games. Because uh, there's one game on this list that is not a long game at all, and it kind of surprised me that it was on this list as a result of that. Like, will people play? Will people pay a lot of money for a 20-minute uh, a game versus will they pay a lot of money for a two-hour game, a three-hour game? How much does that time factor into people's willingness to pay more money? Um, and I, I think all many of these things come down to value. How much value do people feel like they're getting out of a game that costs over eighty dollars? Uh, and Twilight Imperium definitely fits that bill. Oh, here's that game that I was talking about: Escape Curse of the Temple. This is one that really surprised me. This is over eighty dollars um, retail, the MSRP. And I think part of it is that it's a big box. There's a lot of expansions in the game, but this is the one that's literally a ten minute game. And, uh, and apparently people are, are willing to pay for it despite that, um, which does surprise me a little bit. I'm not saying that this game isn't worth it, um, but the, the core game, like if I knew I was signing up to, to play a 10-minute game, probably the, like that time frame definitely would influence my, the amount that I'm willing to pay as a consumer. So that one surprised me a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, Arcadia Quest Inferno. That's one that I that I've played. I think, I think the regular Arcadia Quest isn't over eighty, but I think Arcadia Quest Inferno is again another miniatures heavy game. Mansions of Madness Second Edition. This is an interesting one because I think a lot of the cost. Part of it is the miniatures, but part of it definitely goes into that wonderful app that goes along with Mansions of Madness Second Edition. That is a game that costs over eighty dollars. It includes several scenarios in the box, um, but it gets even more expensive as you want to add more scenarios after that. So I think part of it is replayability, part of it is the app, part of it is the miniatures. Star Wars Rebellion costs more than $80. Um, this is an epic, long, two-player uh, game with a lot of miniatures, a lot of bits and pieces, and a license. 
that's something that I haven't mentioned yet. I think that's the first one that has a license on it. Yeah, uh, I can see how a license would bump bump a game up over eighty dollars, and how people might be able to more willing to pay for a very popular license. Uh, El Grande Big Box, another big box game with a lot of expansions built into it. Um, Imperial Assault, another game with a license. I'll jump to another game with a license. The Reckoners also has a license. Reckoners is another one with a really, it features really nice inserts in the game. Um, I, I was thinking I might find a pattern with, on this list of that, but surprisingly, few of these games have very nice inserts, but the Reckoners definitely does. Who Goes There also does. That's another one that's over $90. Another one with, um, with uh, a high MSRP and miniatures. I don't see a pattern on this list with... Um, Competitive versus cooperative games seems like a, a, a mix between the two. Uh, Caverna. Caverna is over $80. Similar to A Feast for Odin and Gaia Project. Just a lot of stuff in that box. Archipelago. Uh, that one surprised me a little bit, but I can see Archipelago being pretty expensive to make. There's a lot of stuff in the Arch Archipelago box. Food Chain Magnet. I think this is one that's on this list uh, largely because uh, the company that makes it makes small print runs. And so when you make a print run of only 1,000 games or 2,000 games, it's going to cost a lot more per unit, and that drives up the MSRP just as a result of how few games you're making. Um, so I think that definitely, from, from what I understand, I, I don't know if this is for sure the facts, but that's what I've heard about this company, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why they, they uh, list a higher MSRP on this game. Um, and then we have some weird ones. Here are, the, here are a few weird ones that... Are kind of on the edge here because these aren't games that are typically offered in retail. They are games that are offered directly from the publisher. Uh, and one of them, The Seventh Continent, is only available through Kickstarter. You can only, as far as I know, you can only get that game through Kickstarter. It would have a higher than 80 MSRP if it uh, were sold through retail. And I think that's interestingly one of the reasons this company has decided not to go to retail because they don't want people to have to pay that much for the game. When they sell it directly, they don't have to deal with MSRP. They don't even have to think about it. They can just think about, okay, this is what we're giving you. How much are you willing to pay us for it? And, and that's kind of an a interesting decision and a, and a very modern one. I, I appreciate that approach. Too Many Bones is the other one. That, that company, also, I don't They might sell a little bit to retail, but I think primarily they sell direct. And their games cost quite a bit. I think their MSRP, MSRP for Too Many Bones might be over 140 at this point. Um, and that game has a lot of dice. I think that's one of the few games on this list that has that features dice as the main component. Uh, the Reckoners does too. The Reckoners has quite a few dice in the game, but Too Many Bones definitely does too. So we, I've seen some patterns here. Yeah, a lot of these games are definitely in the top 100. Too Many Bones, Seventh Continent, Mechs versus Minions. That was one that was a little bit shaky on the list. Like they charge 75 for Mechs versus Minions, but really that MSRP should be about 150. Um, I don't know the ranking for the Reckoners or Archipelago. Imperial Assault, El Grande, I'm guessing, this top 100. Star Wars Rebellion definitely is. Mansions of Madness definitely is. Uh, Twilight Imperium is. Uh, Gaia Project, A Feast for Odin. And Railways of the World probably is. Rising Sun definitely is. So a lot of these games on this list are on here because they are highly ranked. Um... Actually, no, they're not on here because they're highly ranked. I think it's just a pattern that they are highly ranked. And I wonder, so one way we could look at that is that uh, if people pay more for a game, then they are more likely to rank it high. That's one stance we could go at. I don't typically agree with that. I've seen people say that about Kickstarter games. They're like, okay, people rank this highly because they want to kind of reassure themselves that they made a good purchase. And so that's why they rate, rate it highly on Board Game Geek. Maybe there's a little bit of something subconscious going on there. Um, but I wonder instead is, for many of these companies that, uh, that make these games, um, if, they are, if they're putting more into them because they're going they're gonna, to they're gonna cost more, they, they, they're putting more time and energy into making them great games. Um, and, and the cost is a reflection of that effort that they put into it. And the components are a part of the game. The components are, I think so many people overlook this when they rate games. Some people, not, not too many people. But 
It's not just about gameplay when you have a game on the table. It's also about the, the tactile and aesthetic presence of the game on the table. That impacts how I feel about the game and impacts my enjoyment of the game. And so these games that have this wealth of beautiful components, um, I think that might contribute to why people are rating them higher. They're having a better experience with them because they're more beautiful. Um, replayability. I, I definitely see a lot of replayability on this list. And weight. In general, these are heavier games. Escape Curse of the Temple is the exception. El Grande isn't a particularly heavy game. Um, I'd say it's a medium weight Euro. And The Reckoners, I would also say, is a medium weight cooperative game. But most of these are pretty heavy games. So I wonder if uh, both for weight and replayability, if they play directly into the value that people are willing to... When people say, okay, am I willing to spend this much money on the game? They look at the value. They say, okay, this is a heavier game. I'm going to... It, it's going to... to meet my expectations in terms of de depth, complexity, um, and replayability. Uh, and also, oh, I forgot the length of the game. I, I, maybe I did, yeah, I mentioned this earlier on in the video, how much length plays into it. It does seem like many of these are longer games, like two hour plus games, so that might play into it as well. One little uh, fun tidbit, I did a demographic survey a few months ago and uh, one of the results was I was asking people, how much would you be willing to pay for a game before uh, you start to seriously reconsider it? Even if you really want the game, if the price, if, what is the price where you're like, okay, I, I just can't, I can't pay more than that. And about a third of, people, of the people said that they were willing to pay over $80 for a game that they really wanted. But that also means, so that's a lot, but the flip side is that Two-thirds of people say that they, even for a game they really want, they are not willing to spend over $80 on it. Um, that's where they draw the line, or that the line is drawn even, even lower for some people. So I think that's something for me as a publisher to keep in, in, in mind, that, uh, that that gateway cost, that cost that, to get you into the game, uh, can immediately exclude quite a few people. Um, yeah, I... I Let's see, I, I have my little top five I'm going to do. I also wanted to mention uh, deluxe games on Kickstarter. So the list that I've talked about specifically today are, are retail MSRPs, the cost that you would pay at a, usually a friendly local game store, what, what price they're going to they're gonna list on the game. But I think deluxe games on Kickstarter, you'll probably be able to think of a lot of other deluxe games on Kickstarter that costed way more than $80 that you were willing to pay for because they had that deluxe uh, logo on them. They, they were saying, okay, this is the, your chance to get the deluxe version of the game. Um, and I think that maybe fear of missing out plays into it a little bit, but also the value, usually with those deluxe prices, you're getting a lot of, a lot more stuff, more replayability, more components, all that stuff. Let's do my ranking real quick um, of my top five uh, games that cost over $80. And I won't include size, obviously, because that's, that's our game. That's my game. Um, all these, all these games are really good. I'll put Star Wars, actually, no, I'll put the seventh continent at the, at the bottom of the list. I haven't pre-ranked these. Uh, and I'll put it at the bottom of the list just because that is the one that isn't technically available in retail as much as I love the seventh continent. I love the exploration elements of it. I think it's a really brilliant design. Um, but I'll put it at the edge just because it isn't technically available from retailers. I'll do Star Wars Rebellion next. That's a game that I, I've had some of the best thematic experiences ever playing that game, but it's too long for me. I, 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 for me, like two and a half hours is kind of the, the limit. I'll go up to three for a game, but my plays in Star Wars Rebellion have been four or five hours. And as amazing as, as they've been, the stories that have come out of them have been amazing. I don't want to commit that much time to playing a game. I don't have that attention span. Um, Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition I'd put next. This is one that... Like, I, I wouldn't have even put close to this list the first time I played it because I played a combat scenario the first time I played it. And I, as you probably know from the way I talk about games, I do not enjoy tactical combat games. But the uh, the other scenarios that we've played have been much more immersive, like mysteries, puzzles, uh, storytelling, uh, rooms disappearing and reappearing in different places. Just some really, really clever, interesting stuff. And I've come to really enjoy my plays of, of Mansions of Madness 2nd second, second, uh, Edition. Railways of the World, the one that I, I don't even know if it should cost more than $80, but Railways of the World does cost. It has a $99 MSRP. 
And it is just, it, it feels epic to me when it's on the table purely because the board is so darn big. It is a huge board and uh, it, it takes two tables usually to play because we have the, the board on one table and then all the cards set up on the other table. Um, so it just gives me an epic feel when I play and it, it's just very satisfying. I, I think I have a video on it, but I, 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 I love the, connecting the routes in it. It just, it feels epic for me. It's one of my favorite uh, route building games, which speaking of which is a, uh, a list that I need to do soon. So I'll make sure that's on the list. And then uh, last, A Feast for Odin. A Feast for Odin has to be on there. That was my, I think it was my number one, number two game. One of the recent times that I did a top 10 list. And uh, it got knocked out a little bit after I played the expansion, but I think pure, I, I think the expansion actually makes the game even better. But the first time it was a, kind of a brain-burning experience for me to, to relearn aspects of the game specifically for the expansion. But uh, Feast of Roden is a game that I absolutely love. And that, uh, like many of these, these games on this list, I feel like I'm getting my money's worth. I think that's maybe what it comes down to. I feel like I'm getting my money's worth for these games because of the components, the replayability, how, how good they are, how good the mechanisms are, they are, that they are longer games. I'm not just sitting down for 10, 15 minutes. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the weight, the complexity, the replayability, all that stuff, I think, plays into the, the value that I feel like I'm getting out of these games. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Um, whether I, I'd like to hear what your favorite games are that that retail at over 80, and I've kind of included all of them on this list. I, I don't, you might be able to find a game that retail is, re, that I missed, but I'm not looking for the games that you paid the most for on Kickstarter. I'm looking for the games that at retail, on the shelf right now, the cost is higher than $80, and if you're willing to pay that. And what, which games that you have on your list that you were willing to pay that much more at retail, the retail version of the game, um, not the deluxe version of the, version of the game on Kickstarter. And going back to my question about online retailers, does that impact uh, how you look at price? Do you care about the MSRP or do you just care the amount that you pay from the online retailer? And really anything else you want to share? It's a pretty broad topic. I've jumped around a bit, but I would love to hear your thoughts about this topic of games that retail for over $80. Uh, how can you justify it? How do you look at value? Do, are you ever willing to pay that much? Any of your thoughts, post in the comments below and we'll have a conversation about it. All right. Thanks.